Uh, thanks, everyone, and welcome to the change orientation for OGS OMP OPS 3.4. This kicks off the internal testing round based on the first release candidate. We have two weeks for that, followed by the second release candidate, which will be the source of community testing. And then hopefully in not many more weeks after that, we'll have uh, the release of 3.4.0. Um, we have a lot of things to get through today, so let me just jump into it right away. Um, first, I want to just remind everyone of where we are in our release strategy now that we have both the uh, the uh, main and we have the LTS release strategies going on at the same time. So 3.3 will continue to be supported for quite some time. Um, but this is the first of the releases that we have that is a new release that is not um, on the LTS line. So for hosting, for example, you might decide that some of your journals would stay on LTS. They would be able to just stay no fuss on a very stable line of things. But if some folks want some of the new features that are out in 3.4, um, they would be able to hop to the uh, the 3.4 track and then presumably from there to 3.5, 3.6. If they wanted to go right from 3.4 to 3.7 LTS, then that would be totally fine. But we now have these two tracks that are an option. Um, the LTS line will be more uh, long-term. Uh, the 3.4 release is likely not to be maintained as long as the 3.3 LTS. So you might find that you need to hop to 3.5 to stay on a maintained uh, track. Um, and these last two, like the 3.7 LTS is our expected next LTS, but it's not totally confirmed yet. Right, um, I will pass off to Nate for the first portion of our demonstration. So Nate, I'll stop screen sharing and over to you. Great, can everyone see my screen? Okay. Um, yeah, as Alex said, there's a lot to get into, so I'm going to go straight into it. Um, there will be some time for questions uh, after each one of the things that I'm, I'm presenting here, um, but not a ton of it. So if you could just go ahead and dump your questions into the chat. If other people can answer them in chat, they'll go ahead. Um, otherwise, we'll try and pick a couple of the ones we've got time for. So uh, the very first thing I'm going to talk about is DOIs, how we manage DOIs in the system and how those DOIs are deposited to a registration agency like Crossref or Datacite. Um, first off, a big thanks to Eric, who's done pretty much all of the work on this, Eric Hansen, uh, as well as Crossref, who funded a, a good chunk of this. Um, our main concern with this was to reduce the number of problems that journals and journal managers have when they come to deposit their DOIs and metadata with a registration agency. So um, a lot of the changes have been designed to, to reduce those problems. Um, the first big thing that's changed is that there's no longer a DOI plugin. So if you're familiar with going into the plugin settings and configuring your DOI there, that's all gone. DOIs are now part of the core application. Um, and you'll go to, to enable them, you're going to the workflow, oh no, sorry, you'll go into the distribution settings. And you'll see a new tab here for DOIs, uh, and you can enable them here. Now, almost everyone's already going to have DOIs enabled. If you had the DOI plugin enabled when you upgrade, this will automatically be enabled. If you're a new installation, it'll automatically be enabled. But if they're not enabled for any reason, you can come in here to enable them. Um, so you can also decide, like before, which items will have the DOIs. I'll go ahead and put my prefix in. This is just an example one. It's not a real prefix. Um, and then there's a setting here for automatic DOI assignment. Uh, so when we talk about assigning DOIs, we're just talking about uh, generating a DOI number or, or value uh, and uh, assigning it to the submission in the system. This is different from when we actually register or deposit a DOI with a registration agency. This is just about assigning it within the system. But we've got a couple options. The default one, which we'll encourage, is for you to just automatically assign a DOI to any submission that reaches the copy editing stage. So as soon as it it's accepted from review, uh, a DOI will be created and assigned to that object. That way, you've already got the DOI in the system if you wanted to include it in a, a PDF galley or something like that. The DOI is created, it's assigned to the submission. If you don't like that, you can also have the submission, uh, the DOI generated when the submission is published, or you can turn automatic DOI assignment off completely if you just want to manage your DOIs manually. The next thing is the DOI format. Um, so this is uh, if you remember the old system, there is a lot of ways that you could uh, customize, set a pattern for the way the DOI suffix would be generated. You might include the issue volume and number, maybe the year, maybe the publication number. There's all this uh, data that you could bake into the DOI. 
we're really, really strongly encouraging people not to do that. Uh, so all new installations will default to our um, default DOI format, which is just a unique eight character suffix that's generated for every DOI. Um, if you if your editors really insist, they can come in here and they can edit those uh, custom patterns. And if you're upgrading from an existing um, system that did have those patterns in place, like a, a 3.3 or whatever, then those patterns will be brought over. But like I said, we're really strongly discouraging this because uh, this is a source of a bunch of problems that people have with DOI deposits. So um, uh, oftentimes when it came time to create the DOI, if you're using the issue data or some kind of data, the system would be unable to generate the DOI. So you'd publish it, you'd expect the DOI to be there and it just wouldn't be there. Or you'd go to deposit the DOI and there'd be some kind of formatting problem and you wouldn't be able to deposit that DOI. So we're really, really strongly encouraging people to just go with this default um, DOI format. The next thing I'll talk about is the registration agencies. So now that I've enabled the DOIs, uh, I can come in here and I can select the DOI registration agency. Uh, we've upgraded the Crossref and the data site plugins. So they're both uh, valid registration agencies that you can configure. I've only got Crossref set up. Um, when I come in, you can see I can put all my credentials in for Crossref. These are all fake credentials, so don't worry about that. Uh, we've also updated the help text. Um, this is really in response to uh, a lot of problems that we've heard from Crossref support team, as well as our own publishing services support team about difficulties that people have getting their Crossref set up. So uh, we got together and, and um, uh, improved some of the language around uh, helping people get this stuff configured. I'll come back up here to this automatic deposit. Uh, so because we've got a registration agency configured, uh, we can, if we want, just enable automatic depositing. So if you were using the default DOI suffix formats that we're advising you to use, and you've got automatic DOI assignments set up for copy editing or the pub or on publishing, um, and you've got this enable automatic depositing set up, you have to do nothing for DOIs to work. DOIs will just be created and deposited with the registration agency without any human intervention at all. Uh, and this is really what we're encouraging everyone to get to, because as soon as you get humans involved trying to edit things manually or configure how it works, all of a sudden that's when you get into a lot of problems. So we really encourage people just to set this up and never touch it again. But that's not always gonna happen, we know. Um, so now I've got the registration agency set up, I'm gonna show you what the new DOI management page looks like. Uh, once DOI is enabled, I'll have to refresh the page to make it appear, but you'll see on the top left here, there's a new page for DOIs. So I'll go to that. And this is our new UI for managing all of your DOIs. So if you remember in past, you would go to the submission workflow, you would find the DOI field and you generate a DOI there. Uh, that's all gone. The only place you'll add or assign or register or manage DOIs is from this interface. Uh, the filters here will help you kind of find um, Find submissions. We've we've included some descriptions to help you understand the filters. Broadly speaking, everything in this status thing. This is about whether something has a DOI or not. Whether you need to assign it to a, a DOI or not. Um, and then once a submission is published, then you're going to want to think about these um, filters down here. These all have to do with registration with an agency. So uh, has it been registered yet? Has it been submitted but it hasn't been confirmed yet? Uh, once it's marked registered, that means uh, that it's been confirmed by the registration agency. Uh, and if there's been any error in automatic deposit, that'll also get flagged as well. Um, this last one needs sync. This will happen, for example, let's say you've got a submission, a published submission. You've already got the DOI assigned and it's deposited with all the metadata to your registration agency. Um, but then after that, you've gone and maybe published a new version of this article. At that point, the published version that you have is out of sync with the, the metadata that the registration agency has. So it just needs to be resynced. So um, in that case, it'll be marked with this need sync filter. You can come in and find it and you can redeposit it at any time. Now, as I said before, um, if, you, if you're using our defaults, you really don't have to worry about too much at all. So for example, maybe you've turned automatic depositing off, but if you're using our default suffix format, 
and you're automatically generating that DOI at copy editing, um, then by the time you get to this interface, every everything's already going to have a DOI. You'll never have to go in and like manually assign a DOI or anything. It'll all be done for you. Uh, all you really have to do is come in here after you publish an issue, click that deposit all button, uh, and then have it deposit all the DOIs for you. We know that that isn't always the case. Um, so if you do have some things that maybe you want to, you need to manually manage for whatever reason, we have new bulk actions. Uh, so if I come in and open up this submission, Carter says Zaid, um, you can see it doesn't have a DOI and I can just click this and I can select as many as I wanted, come up to bulk actions and say, assign a DOI. That DOI is automatically going to be assigned. And then I could either click this deposit DOI button here to deposit it, or if I had a bunch that I wanted to do, I could use the checkboxes, come up here and say deposit DOI. Now, this is going to take a little bit of time because it's actually communicating with the Crossref server to deposit this one DOI. Um, if you're doing a whole bunch at once, those will get put into the job system. Uh, so it won't try and deposit 400 all at once. It'll just try and deposit uh, one at a time. Um, uh, but you'll notice that it comes back as an error. And that's just because uh, I don't have valid credentials for Crossref. Those were just dummy credentials I put in. Uh, so I can come down here, I can look at the error, and I can see I was unauthorized. Um, some of the error messages that might get returned by Crossref can be quite complex. It could be a complex XML string, for example. Um, we don't necessarily expect editors to be able to understand those error messages, uh, but it will really help the Crossref support team as well as uh, our own publishing services support team and any any anyone who's doing kind of publishing services. They'll be able to come into the system, see what the actual error message was, and coordinate with the Crossref team to make sure uh, this stuff gets deposited more easily. Um, finally, uh, I will show you what happens in cases where you really want that manual control. Um, so some people don't want DOIs to be automatically generated. Uh, maybe, for example, you're importing back issues or something where uh, an article already has a DOI and you don't want to change it. You don't want to create a new one. And you don't want a new one to get registered. Um, so anyone can come in here and just manually input a DOI and save that DOI. And at this point, it's all ready to go, ready to be deposited, except in this case, usually you've already got it deposited. Maybe you manually deposited this through Crossref interface or something like that. Uh, so you can come in here and you can mark that uh, as registered. And that will just manually mark it in the system as registered so that the automatic processes don't try and go and register that. Okay, last thing I'm going to show you about this, and then I'll open up for questions, is um, so 90, 95% of our community only use DOIs for the uh, article. Um, but in some cases, uh, people like to assign DOIs to issues as well as to article galleys. Um, I've just turned Crossref ref off because Crossref actually limits what kinds of DOIs they can receive. Um, they prefer to only receive DOIs related to issues or articles. Um, but I've turned that off and I've assigned it for all those. Now when you come over here, I can go to this bulk actions, I can expand all, and you'll see uh, every submission that has a PDF galley has a slot for a DOI. Now, if I had had all this configured earlier in the process, these DOIs would have automatically been generated and they just would have been there already. I wouldn't have to do any manual step. Uh, but because I just enabled galley PDFs, I'd have to come in here um, and again, use that bulk actions to assign DOIs. And you'll see that they can appear there. Okay, so that's everything that I had specifically around DOIs. Um, does anyone have any questions about that? Is there anything in particular that wasn't answered in the chat? It looks like everything's been answered on the chat. Great, okay, then I'm going to move on to the next thing. The next thing I'm going to talk about is editorial decisions. Uh, so the way that people record editorial decisions in the system has been changed completely. Uh, our main motivation here was to improve the UX. 
but we especially wanted to focus on being able to take kind of multiple actions as you record a decision, especially in terms of how people um, notify different people when a decision is recorded. So right now we're looking at a uh, submission in the review stage, and I'm going to go ahead and request revisions. So this is the screen uh, where all, um, all editorial decisions will go through this step-by-step -step UI. So this particular decision has two steps. First step is notify authors. The next, next step is notify reviewers. Um, I want to spend a bit of time now talking about this email composer UI. So here we're sending an email to the author. Uh, and this email composer UI is only used right now in the editorial decisions, uh, but it's our goal to eventually use this wherever people send emails. So if they're writing a discussion, a new discussion, we want to be able to use this UI. If they're assigning a reviewer and sending that reviewer a, a request email, we want to be able to use this UI. Um, but at least for this version right now, this is all we've had time to work on. Um, first thing I'll show you is uh, when, when the email comes in, the email template's automatically loaded and everything's already rendered out. So the author's name is here, the submission title is shown, uh, and because the email template includes it, uh, you can also see the reviewer comments. They're automatically brought in. You can also attach files um, from, from this UI, and you can attach files basically from any way you want. So um, you can upload a brand new file if you wanted to, and then attach that, and you'll see it appears down here um, with the attach files. Uh, if the reviewers had uploaded any files, you'd be able to see them under here. You can attach that um, it, as submission files. So this is any file that the author's uploaded to say revisions, or you can go to review files. This will be basically any submission file that's in the current stage. So if this were a decision related to copy editing, you get the copy editing files. Um, and finally, they could also attach files directly from the publisher or submission libraries. So in this example, the journal has uploaded a file for their authors that tells them how they want them to format their revisions, for example. So I can go ahead and just attach that in to the email. Uh, the next thing I'll show you is this insert content button. Um, so this, this existed before, but we've kind of redesigned it to make it a little easier to use. Uh, so let's say that I was editing this submission and I, I had accidentally deleted the title or I didn't have it originally, and I wanted to insert the title, but I didn't remember what it was. I can click this insert content button. It'll show me all the different content I can insert, but I'll probably just go up here and search for the title. It'll show it to me. I click the insert button, and then it'll appear. We've also added support for CC and BCC to all the editorial decision emails, so you can add that on. Um, and we also have a feature to switch languages. Uh, so if you, if I know that the author prefers normally working in French, but I normally work in English, um, I can go ahead and switch this email over. Um, and obviously it's not gonna translate the email in there, but it's gonna load the email template back in. So any changes I made be lost, but it'll switch to French. And you'll notice the email template's not quite there, um, but that's just because uh, with the release candidate at the stage it's at now, the translators haven't yet translated all of our email templates over. So um, this is something that'll be happening during the release candidate phase. Um, so that's step one, notify the authors. I'll go ahead and continue. So I've got an ambulance outside. I'm just going to mute for half a second. Sorry about that. I'm on a, I'm on a throughway for the ambulance traffic in my city. So it's quite a common, common thing to get. Um, okay. So step two is notify reviewers. You'll notice the UI is pretty much the same. Uh, we've got both reviewers here in here. Uh, you probably didn't notice because I breezed right past it, but there are actually four review assignments for this submission. But one of them is overdue, meaning the reviewer never responded. And the other one was declined. Uh, the reviewer said they couldn't do it. So uh, when we go to notify reviewers, we're only going to notify those reviewers who, are, um, who actually completed a review. Um, also, if you want, you can skip the email. Um, we're really discouraging this. You know, we've made a point of designing this to be small and out of the way because we don't want to attract attention to it. 
Um, we really want to encourage editors to communicate with everyone involved whenever a decision is made. Uh, but we know sometimes communications happened outside of the system. So if you want, you can skip the email uh, and not have it sent. Um, and then go ahead and record the decision, record the decision um, and you'll see, it'll just say what happened. You can go to view that submission. Okay, the next thing I'm gonna talk about is uh, how you actually manage the emails, email notifications and the email templates. So here I'm over in the workflow settings and there's an emails tab. And this emails tab existed before, but it's changed a little bit. So I'll walk you through a couple of the settings. First is this link to go and add an edit templates. So we'll, we'll cover that in just a minute. Uh, second is the signature, which you'll be familiar with. We've changed the default signature a little bit uh, because uh, we're making a point throughout the system to try and distinguish between emails that are sent by a person, like an editor who's, who's actually crafting this email, versus those that are sent automatically by the system. Uh, and since this signature is pretty much always used for automated emails, um, we wanted the signature to reflect that, just so the recipient knows that um, uh, the editor hasn't sent this email out manually. It's, it's the system that's sending it. Uh, under new submission, you'll notice the settings around the submission wizard, which Tabika will talk about soon. Um, and this, this will tell you, um, sorry, this will, uh, this will, for example, let you configure who receives a submission confirmation email. Should it be all the authors on the submission, just the submitting author, uh, or no one? Um, if you're familiar with the old system, you could disable some email templates. Uh, that's no longer possible. And every way you could disable an email template, you'll find a setting now for actually turning that on or off. Um, and uh, there's also a similar thing for editorial decisions. So you can choose who, who receives uh, those messages. Okay, so I'm gonna go look at the screen for adding and editing email templates. This looks broadly similar to the way things looked before. Uh, however, underneath the hood is completely different. Um, the things that are basically the same are the filters uh, and the emails that you'll see. Um, whenever an email is sent out automatically, um, meaning the system just sends it out, there's no editor there editing the email template or anything like that. Um, you'll, when you click edit, you'll just edit the email template like normal, like you always did. The big change is around situations where an email is being sent and the user actually has a choice between choosing one or another template or things like that. So for example, we now have entries for uh, discussions in each of the, the stages. So for example, if I want to send, uh, sorry, one second, I've got to sneeze. Sorry about that. Uh, so for example, if, you, uh, if we're in the review stage and we're starting a discussion, for example, where there are multiple templates we could use. So when you click this edit button, you'll see the default template, but you'll also be able to add custom templates. So here, uh, I've already input a, a few custom templates, one for what I wanna request anonymized files from an author, for example, or another one where maybe I'm the managing editor and I wanna nudge my uh, assigned editor to go ahead and start assigning reviewers. I created an email template just to do that. And the way that works out is if I'm here in the discussion uh, and I create a discussion, these templates will just appear here, the ones that I assigned through the, um, the email template UI. Uh, and I can just load those up and they load in with all the, the stuff just like the others. It, like I said, it doesn't use that UI, the same UI that we have for editorial decisions, but it's our hope eventually we'll use a similar, a similar UI. Uh, I'll just walk through quickly how you um, would create a new email template. So I'm going to look for that accept decision. So this is when a submission has been accepted and we're recording that decision and we want to notify the authors. Uh, so you can see I've already put in a couple of uh, a couple of custom email templates and I'm going to add a new one. This one's going to be about trying to um, trying to tell the, uh, the submitting author to remind the co-authors they need to authorize their ORCID. So if you're familiar with the ORCID workflow, um, the editors can request each co-author to author authenticate their ORCID, uh, but I'm sure that doesn't happen sometimes. So um, we'll just pretend we're in here. Uh, and again, now that I'm making an email template, I could actually use these email template variables. 
Uh, and before it wasn't always clear exactly which email variables could you, could not be used. But now when you come in here and hit insert content, you can see every single email variable that's available to you along with the description of that variable. And you'll see each of these is unique to the specific email. So because this is a review related um, decision, you can see it's got all review comments as an option. Uh, because it's related to an editorial decision, you can see the name of the decision or the description of the decision, uh, things like that. You can, you can put those in. Um, one of the common variables is the recipient name. So I'm going to go ahead and insert that. Uh, and then I'll say, uh, thanks for your submission. Um, and I can use the title again. So it's going to search for that. Uh, and then I can complete my email. And then again, depends on who's going to be sending this, who should sign off. So I could actually use the signature, uh, the email signature of the sender. So whichever editor happens to be sending this, uh, that would get replaced. So I'll go ahead and save that. Um, and now if I come over here, this is the uh, that submission in the review stage. I'll go ahead and accept the submission. And again, we're going to see a similar UI to the one we saw before with three steps this time. Um, and I can see all of the email templates that I just configured in that thing. So I could just click on this. It'll load up. The author name's in there. The title's in there. Uh, I'm logged in currently as Daniel Barnes. And this is his signature. So uh, all that just gets put in there for me. Um, I'll go ahead and register this real quick because I want to show you also um, this is uh, any decision where you're moving files from one stage to the next will have this step for selecting files. Uh, so here we get to move any of the revisions from re uh, revisions over to copy editing. I'll go ahead and record that decision. Okay. Um, one thing I wanted to, to cover real quick is uh, the actual body of these email templates. Um, so this is a brand new uh, submission accepted email body uh, that's been written. Um, Kate did a whole bunch of work on this email as well as uh, almost all of the emails in the system. Um, as, and that's Kate Shuttleworth, sorry. And uh, uh, also big thanks to Emma and Veronica from Open Academia who consulted on this. Uh, but pretty much every email template in the system uh, has been rewritten and really just improved massively. Uh, so for one, they're just a lot more informative about uh, what's happening, what you need to do next, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and also the language has just been improved a lot to make it more warm, friendly, uh, as well as just less robotic. A lot of our email templates were quite uh, robotic before where it would just say something like, you have a decision and then decision accept, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but it's all been rewritten uh, to be a lot more um, friendly and informative for, for people receiving these emails. So, most of the time when you're upgrading, you're already going to have email templates in the system. You won't benefit from that. But if your journal hasn't really configured the email templates much, I really strongly encourage you to go up and use this reset all button to take advantage of the new default templates because they're they're fantastic. Uh, OK, a couple of brief things to cover, and then we'll get back to um, the, um, the, 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 the last for some questions. First is. Uh, this whole setup around here um, uh, reflects a complete ripping out of our whole email system from previous versions and replacement. Vitaly's done an enormous amount of work um, integrating Laravel's mailer and mailables classes. Uh, and we've got some good documentation on that in our developer documentation that's available now. Um, so you can read about how you would go about just quickly adding and sending an email, uh, as well as uh, it's possible with Laravel's new mailer system to really easily integrate sending to third-party services like Mailgun or Amazon's SES or Postmark or something like that. And Vitaly's actually got a sample plugin that shows how to send email through Mailgun, for example. Um, so that's an enormous amount of work that will help uh, system administrators. Uh, and one last thing on the editorial decisions. Um, so now here, this is the submission. It's now in copy editing because I just did uh, accept. And you'll notice there's a new editorial decision to cancel copy editing. So these decisions exist for every stage now. So if I was in production, I could go from production back to copy editing. 
And if I was in review, I could go from review back to submission. So I'll go ahead and cancel this and send it back to review. And again, this is a this is an example of a editorial decision with just one step. There's not multiple steps. And now it's back to the review. Um, and you'll notice I can't actually send it back to, to submission from here. And that's because we've already got reviews in the system. Once reviewers are in the system, we can't really delete this review round. Um, so we can't do it. But if I were to start a new review round, for example, by accident, um, or even if I was to send a submission from the submission stage to review by accident, uh, if there was nothing yet in that review round, for example, if it looks like it looks here with no reviewers at all, then I can come in here and I can cancel that review round and I can go back. Um, the whole architecture around decisions has been uh, completely remade. Uh, so if you're interested in any of the technical stuff around that, we have that documented as well um, in our uh, developer documentation. Uh, if you are a host or, or ever write customizations, I strongly encourage you to look at it because um, the way we're doing the editorial decisions now, they're really adaptable. Um, you could add custom actions in here, custom decisions, all that sort of stuff. Uh, to really, to really adapt the submission workflow to, to the particular journal. So that's everything I've got. I've got a little bit over time, so we're probably gonna rush through. Is there any kind of key questions that couldn't be answered in the chat? Patricia has one, but if you don't mind, maybe we'll do that on chat while we move on to the next presentation. Perfect. Yeah. Um, Uh, and Devika, I think it's over to you next. Sorry. <laughs> sure. So um, I'll walk you all through uh, the new submission wizard that we all have. Just give me a second. I'll share my screen. Let me know if it's visible. Yep. Okay. Great. So uh, once we land on the dashboard and we go on new submissions, uh, this is a change we've made where we have a pre-flight screen now. Um, the text over here, say before you begin and throughout wherever we've given sort of cue texts are customizable. All you'll have to do is um, go on settings, workflow, um, submission and author guidance, and all these guidelines and texts can be customized according to your need. So I'll just go back to the screen. Um, if we have multiple languages enabled in the journal, we can choose the primary language of the submission. So here I'll choose English and uh, uh, we can, you uh, we can type like say um, a, um, a title, we can mention the section in which uh, this uh, submission is going to go in along with the submission checklist. And um, just one second, uh, a privacy consent. And once we go next, Uh, you will see that we now have a step-by-step -step wizard, which will highlight all the uh, steps that the person will go through. Uh, so once we start with submission details, the title will already be carried forward. Uh, we can put the um, keywords. Um, all of these texts uh, can be, say, uh, all of these sections can be something that are required and compulsory versus that are non-required. For that, all you'll have to do is, again, go through work settings, workflow, submission, and metadata. And here you can choose between, say, if you want to make the keywords, um, like if you want to show the keywords, but you don't want to make it mandatory, or the fact that um, you know the references you just want to ask them but like not make it compulsory or even the categories um in title what you can also see is that we have rich, uh, rich text titles as well so i can like choose to bold or uh, you know underline this title and we'll have the abstract along with 
any references that we want to. If you see, we now have a button for save for later. So we can click on save for later and whatever step we are in the data gets um, saved and we can come back to it later. So if we were to go in submissions um, here under my queue, you can see that my uh, submission is incomplete and I can choose to view it and go back um, to the details screen where I can, uh, you know, um, start filling the details. What can also happen is sometimes your internet breaks off um, and you know, you're not, and the information does not auto save. So here's a video of what happens when um, your internet, you know, goes off. So uh, like you've seen, it saves whatever information that went by. And then once you come back, um, it regains from where we stopped. Um, if I was to go continue next, we can upload the file. Um, let's just upload a file. We can also select um, the kind of file this is. So we have an option of what kinds of files can be seen. So if I was to click on article text and save, um, it will save that as. Uh, once we continue, um, here we have changed um, the UI for the add contributor field. So here, if I was to say, um, Devika test, um, choose a country. You can also see that, you know, they can put their ORCID ID, a bio statement, the affiliation and their role in OGS system. And if I was to click on save and say there's another contributor, um, and I save, we can also, um, order and like reorder the uh, the contributors along with uh, showing a preview of how it will be seen as abbreviated on the publication list and in full. Um, if I was to continue, um, there is a new uh, form field we've introduced, which is the data availability statement, um, which can also be made mandatory uh, if we want to. Um, the next bit is the categories, which can be enabled or disabled um, in this section as well. Like if we do not want the authors to see categories, we can disable it. Um, here, say I choose it as a review, any comments that we want to put. And once we continue, um, we can see that a new, um, step has been introduced, which is review and submit in which we can review all the details we want. Say if I want to go back on details and like, you know, edit something I can, um, you know, say, put it in another language. Um, and go about. And when I click on continue, it will take me through all the steps again. And I can once again review uh, my entire submission. And once um, I'm okay with everything, I can agree to the copyright statement and click on submit. Um, the copyright statement is now um, seen in the activity log. So say if, uh, I was to go on the submission and see it under the username. Uh, I can see that in the activity log, it is mentioned that, you know, I have agreed to the copyright terms for submission. Um, 
another thing that we could also do now is um, if we were to go on settings, journals and sections um, or categories in every sections, we can auto assign um, editors. So say we can select the editorial users who can assign automatically to new submissions and we can assign them on their categories as and when we want. Um, and that's it on OGS. That's the new system. Um, I'll just quickly hop on to uh, OPS where everything's uh, the same. It's just that on for the readers, uh, the author can now select uh, their license and put in their license URL. So um, yeah, that's it on the new um, submission wizard. Does anybody have any question? Great, I think Bujana, you're next. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, let me just uh, share my screen. <laughs> Can you all see my screen now? Yep. Okay, so I will um, uh, present the uh, new statistics and uh, lots of things change and I cannot um, handle it all. I will concentrate on the user as uh, so editors and manager uh, view. And I put in our um, presentation uh, slides, the link to the documentation, to the issue that uh, contains all documentation links. So you can maybe find further information, especially the system admins about the few topics that I will not handle today. Uh, the documentation is not finished, but um, it will be integrated into our uh, documentation then. So now to note that there is no uh, user stats plugin anymore, that the statistics are part of the core, core and the, so the settings are at a different place. Administration, admin settings are at administration site settings, and then statistics. Uh, there is the possibility to select the level of geographical data that you would like to collect to enable the institutional statistics to decide if you want to, to keep also daily statistics in the database or only monthly. If you would like to compress the archived uh, log files and some sushi uh, stati uh, settings, uh, uh, um, sushi's um, protocol uh, defined by counter release five. Uh, there are some default settings, they are minimal. For example, there will be no uh, collection of geographical uh, statistics. Per default, the institutional statistics are disabled. We track only monthly statistics and log files are not, not compressed. So you can change it here and define also the um, like um, the level of details also for the journals. I mean, if you, for example, if you select not to collect geographical data, the journals on the journal level, it will also not be possible. Or if you select to collect only country uh, geographical data, then the journal cannot so, uh, choose to, to have also region or city. Um, I will show, so if needed, then, um, the journal settings would need to be adapted or for every journal. Uh, the journal settings are under distribution and statistics. Some of them, uh, some of those uh, admin settings can be overwritten on the journal level and always uh, uh, not that broad as admin for, uh, as, um, because on the admin level, uh, we collect city, the journal can choose uh, some uh, option on the less level than the city. 
it can disable the uh, institutional st the statistics or decide not to make the sashi, sushi uh, API public. Uh, from the user stats plugin, the display stats option are now part of the teams. Uh, so we can go to the website and then team. At the bottom, we will have the option to display usage statistics um, on the article page, either as graph or a line or not at all. And the display is in the, uh, is in the same way as it worked for the usage stats plugin. Um, then I will go further to the statistics pages and reporting. Now there is a statistics page for every object we collect the statistics for, for articles, issues and journal index page in this case. Uh, I think the articles are most important, so I will concentrate on that. Uh, all the other pages look similar. The page looks uh, the same as it is. You can select the for the timeline, if you would like to see abstract uh, views or file downloads, daily or monthly uh, statistics, uh, you can choose the period you, you would like the statistics for, the filter sections, and the new filter is um, uh, filtering by issues. Uh, here is uh, the same information as there were uh, earlier. And the new button is download report that leads us to the download um, model. First, the filter selected on the previous page are uh, displayed. They will be used for the reports that you would like to download. There are four articles, uh, statistics. There are these four types of reports. Articles report is pretty much the same um, information contains the same information as this page um, having the abstract views and file downloads uh, di divided by PDF, HTML and other as and the totals. Uh, the files is a new uh, report that would provide the total file downloads number for each file also uh, for the supplementary files. So if one would like to have any statistics about supplementary files, one would uh, use this report. Timeline um, report is pretty much the same information that you would see on this graph uh, on the statistics article page. It would show the number of views or file up file downloads, uh, uh, that depending on what you have selected for each day or month. Uh, this uh, report contains the total numbers and not divided by, uh, uh, yes, by articles. So if you would like to have a timeline for one specific article, you would first need to search and filter by that article and then to, to uh, choose this, download this timeline uh, report. Geographic report um, shows and contains the number of the total numbers for each city, region, or country, depending on your settings that uh, settings uh, and level of data that you have chosen. Um, I would maybe just uh, quickly show how they then look like, uh, how, what they contain. This is the article report. It is pretty much the same as the view report. And now the re view report does not exist anymore because it's possible to get the report here. Uh, then the file would list all the file with an ID and names and uh, um, if it's primary or supplementary file and the total numbers. The timeline would list daily, in this case daily uh, total numbers, uh, for, in this case for the uh, uh, abstract views for all articles. And finally, the geographic report that contains uh, the city uh, numbers. Uh, the, the, the numbers are a little bit different, uh, a little bit uh, oriented on counter system. There is a, like a total number and unique, which means the unique um, uh, views for a submission uh, in an hour. One, uh, every 
um, view uh, on a submission in an always counted as one unique view. Uh, okay, that would be it. Then we introduced also the institutional <clears throat> possibility for the institutional statistics. If you enabled it in the settings, you will see this institutions menu uh, item here. This page allows the editing and um, management of the institutions. Mm, you would put the name and the IP ranges. It functions pretty much the same as the institution's uh, form in the institutional subscriptions mm, till now. And um, this data here is used uh, for the statistics, but as well for the uh, in the institutional subscriptions, maybe just to show it how it looks like. It would allow you here to to choose the existing uh, institutions. Um, uh, the institution, uh, the reports for the, institu the uh, institution are only available at the moment at this f in this su sushi API. That means only used for the counter sushi reports, and um, there is no user interface for that now. But will come. The only possible way, and just to show you, is um, uh, at the moment the uh, REST API interface. And you would then uh, see the counter specific metrics and uh, divide it by for each month um, for, for, uh, for one institution. In this case, uh, our in, in a and in a total um, time period. Uh, I haven't uh, said anything about migration and the possibility to, to reprocess the log files and also not about nothing about the geo database that we are using. It's all documented in this admin <clears throat> documentation. So if needed, we could maybe do another overview just for those admin parts, but, but I, maybe the documentation is enough to understand it all. Now I will uh, just quickly show um, a few more uh, features in OMP. The possibility to preview an unpublished uh, book. This book is in the production stage and now the, the, this there is a preview button uh, that would uh, mm, provide the preview mm, uh, preview <laughs> view <laughs> preview of this book and the possibility to have chapter landing pages so if you have a chapters when editing a chapter you will now have this uh, option to to choose that this chapter uh, should have its own mm, uh, landing page. Uh, once again, going to the uh, to the view page and clicking the chapter would can be then clicked on, and it would uh, ha have the view or landing page. So that would be it for for my part. I will now. Um, disable, stop the sharing of the screen, but if there are any questions. We've managed those through the chat, but yeah, feel free to uh, drop in any additional answers you'd like to add. Uh, I will now juggle my screen sharing. Um, can somebody give me a thumbs up if that's now sharing a small OGS window? Okay, see some thumbs up, great. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk for a few minutes about infrastructure um, and some of the changes that we've prepared for not just 3.4, but also uh, introduced in 3.3 and really started to rely upon. So um, first is a couple of things that are, they're a bit of a niche subject, but they really affect some of the larger hosts, especially uh, multi-journal users. Uh, one is ensuring that managers can control enrollments within their own journals. Um, if you happen to have a multi-journal OGS install and you have users who are active across 
uh, two different journals, for example, then you will probably have run into a problem where um, as soon as you have a user who's active in a second journal, the manager of the first journal will no longer be able to control their enrollments. So just to show you what that looks like now, um, I'm going to go into journal and public knowledge. The user I'm logged in right now in as is an uh, is a journal manager of one journal, but not the other. And if a user is only active in one journal, then you'll have no trouble being able to uh, work with that user's account. However, as soon as the user is in a second journal, then you'll have this problem where um, previously attempting to edit the user to manage the enrollments of that user within your own journal was not available. Now what you see is when the user is active in a second journal, these fields here are presented only as read-only, so you're not able to interfere with the other journal's operations, but you still can control enrollments within your own journal. The, uh, that's 7391. The second one is ensuring that site administrators have global access within their journals. This is kind of a hidden um, quirk in OGS that's only, uh, well, o o OPS and o MP as well, that's only really visible when you're managing a large set of journals. Essentially, when you when you have an administrator user, that user is going to be the typical user who creates um, contexts, creates journals, creates servers, creates presses. When that happens, they're automatically enrolled as a manager in that same uh, press when it's created. But if you want to more finely grained control and separate your administrators from your managers, or if you go through the process of creating a second administrator account, that administrator account won't necessarily have a manager enrollment within each of your contexts. And uh, that'll lead to problems where the managers will have certain abilities that the administrators will not. So what we've done is we've now, um, well, that's a bad example. We've now added uh, a kind of a global, that's because I'm in Daniel Barnes, sorry, let me log in as the right user. We've now added a, a kind of a global um, policy where uh, the administrator will always have uh, implicitly managerial roles. So if I now go through and remove this user from this journal, or if I, let's say, change them from a journal manager to a lowly reviewer, previously, if I was to then uh, try to work as this user, I'd lose access to all the settings stuff on the sidebar here. Now it's going to continue to be giving you uh, implicit uh, um, privileges. The um, next thing I'd like to present is a little bit about upgrades and pre-flight checks. And uh, this is an adaptation of an image I've used to describe upgrades previously. The skull here represents uh, no longer supported versions. And we typically support two main releases um, with every new release. So with the release of 3.4, we are now going to be end of life in support for 3.2 more formally. 3.3 is an LTS release, so it'll continue for a long time. But we also have, uh, it worked a lot on the upgrade process. So hopefully it's no longer about leaping over crevasses. It's about taking a bridge. So um, one concept I'd like to introduce uh, that was pioneered in 3.3, but really used pretty heavily in 3.4 is this idea of a pre-flight check. So um, using this new migration structure, which is what was introduced for 3.3, um, the upgrade process is a lot more linear and structured and less prone to errors, especially being introduced in new code that affects upgrades that happened you know, three, four years ago, which is a real demand on the dev team to understand how those worked. And I'm sure with the hosting team, uh, they found that they've had to dig into some really old code. That's been made a lot more structured and it's no longer necessary. But this concept of a pre-flight pre -flight check um, allows us to do a lot of data cleanup at this preliminary stage, and then to introduce some breaking changes later on. And the idea here is that, well, first of all, there's the introduction of foreign keys, which I'll speak briefly about which is uh, gonna be a huge step in terms of making sure that um, inconsistent and incomplete data is no longer possible to pull forward in the system. But the pre-flight check means that this cycle that you'll be familiar with where you try an upgrade, it fails, you restore from backup, you try again, it fails, you restore from backup. That cycle will be broken by introducing a pre-flight check at the beginning that identifies any problems right at the start of, a, of an upgrade process and gives you a chance to correct it. And then you can rerun that uh, process without having to restore from backup. There is a lot of data cleanup done as part of 3.3 to 3.4 upgrades. And I'm going to present um, a little bit about what that, what that means. Uh, so I'm going to try and do a live demo of some upgrades, which is always a fun time. So bear with me. I'm going to first try and demonstrate a, um, a regular upgrade process that's going to pr provide you with no real surprises. So um, I have some tools locally here that allow me to, sorry, to, the password. I'm loading a backup of OGS 3.2.1 and preparing my system for uh, a test upgrade. Um, so if I do a couple of quick changes to the configuration file, I've got some patches for that, but this is just a normal thing you do from the upgrade uh, documentation. Um, I can now run an upgrade. So I've got 
OJS 3.2.1, and I'm looking to upgrade to 3.4.0. Uh, this is going to be the no surprises version of the upgrade. Well, I'm doing a live demo, so I can't promise that. Um, but this should be what you expect to see in an ideal situation where the upgrade just goes through and runs okay. Uh, you will see this pre-flight check will be part of the upgrade process. This is where a problem would get identified and potentially some data cleanup done. We've done some testing on this with uh, large databases and it does perform much, much better than the 3.2 to 3.3 upgrade. Uh, one of those for the large data set with Cielo, for example, the upgrade literally took a week to run nonstop. This one runs, I think, about an hour and a half with the same database, and that's the largest one that we're aware of. So that's the ideal situation. You get an upgrade that works just fine. I'm going to show you a demonstration now of a system that does not upgrade quite so cleanly. So I'm going to introduce an intentional uh, data error. So same process. I'm going to load my database. This time I'm going to uh, introduce some intentionally bad data in the database. And this is going to be a really common situation you're going to encounter with um, older installs that have been upgraded year by year by year. So this is an announcement setting that belongs to an announcement that doesn't exist. So it's kind of orphaned data. Um, and I'm gonna try the upgrade again. And you'll see what I'm talking about with this pre-flight check where um, before anything really starts, we do a, 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 a integrity check of the data. There's a warning here saying that there's an, a, a, an orphan setting for a missing announcement. The idea of the announcement is one, two, three, four, five. But this is not considered to be crucial data, and we know enough about being able to remove it that we're confident that we can remove that data automatically and no, no uh, manual interventions needed. The upgrade proceeds without any trouble. That, again, is the ideal situation, and for most cases, that's the way that we, um, that we expect things to work. Most data cleanup can be done automatically. I'm just going to do a quick um, run of that same um, introduction of junk data. Um, just to show what this means for the future, we've now added foreign key constraints. So the database checks automatically to see that data has um, all the referred entities that it should have. So if I try to add a setting for a non-existent announcement, the database now stops me from doing that because we've added those constraints. And this is going to mean that going forward, the database for the software is going to be much more predictable. And we're going to have a lot fewer boundary cases where there might have been you know, a submission that was removed, but some things were left over, all that kind of stuff. This gets a lot more smooth for the future, and it'll mean a lot of garbage gets cleaned out from older installs. I'm going to do another demonstration of an upgrade, and this one's going to um, have a, a problem that needs resolution. So again, I'm just going to go through and reload my database, and update my configuration file, and I'm going to introduce a more serious data problem. This is going to be a situation where uh, I'm sure some of you have encountered this during upgrades, where there's an author that has a user group, um, which ident identifies what kind of author they are, that doesn't exist. Um, so for one author record, I've just changed this user group to a non-existent user group. This could happen if, for example, somebody goes in and deletes a user group when there's published content in it, in a version of OGS that didn't uh, check for that situation before allowing the delete to happen. So because authorship um, is one of those things that we consider part of the scholarly record, it's really not good for us to make an assumption about how we should correct that, or of course, to remove the author. So the pre-flight check um, here identifies that there was an orph orphaned author entity uh, entry with a certain author ID, publication ID, and submission ID. This would need to be corrected manually before the upgrade is going to be successful. However, um, we've also had a failure that happened during the pre-flight check. And because the pre-flight check happens um, at the very start of the upgrade process right here, the database is essentially in, we started with 3.2.1 this example, it's gone through the 3.3.x migrations, and now it's looking at the 3.4 migrations. So the upgrade process is not in the normal stage in previous releases of OGS, where in the middle of a complicated set of upgrades, something's broken and everything's now garbage. So what you can do is follow the instructions here, um, successfully upgraded to 3.3.9, but could not be upgraded further. Please correct the error and try again. So this is a new piece that we've introduced here. So if I wanted to, um, correct the data. So let's say um, I could look at my database and see that the only user group IDs I've got are this garbage data, and then there's one number 14. Well, number 14 is going to be the correct one, because that's where all my other authors are. Um, you could go back to your pre-install installation and, and check what the data looks like. I can do a correction uh, in the database and then rerun the upgrade process. And there's no need to restore from backup. It just uh, should work this time. 
Um, I'm going to see if there's any questions about that so far. And actually, I've lost my chat box. I can find it here somewhere. There we go. Uh, maybe I will trust somebody else who's been asking, watching amongst the uh, hosts to flag it. Yeah, I think um, I think we got it. Uh, the Jason is asking about sort of orphan journal content, uh, particularly from installations that tried to delete journals in the past and failed and probably have lots of uh, dead data, whether that be cleaned up automatically. Um, and then uh, Michael was just saying the explanations and failed checks is going to be really helpful. Yeah, and um, we tried as much as possible to reduce the number of um, checks that result in a failure. Uh, but anything that's to do with a submission, with an author, with a publication, the uh, peer review, any of that scholarly record stuff, um, if the submission that it was attached to is gone, it's gone. We know that. It's not presented anywhere. We're not going to suddenly find that content's missing. But if it's a question of inconsistent data, like, again, a, um, a uh, an author that's, that's missing a user group, that's a case where it fails. There's very few of those. And I suspect what we're going to have to do is probably build up a bit of a... a a list of of uh, knowledge base in the support forum of or over specifically how to to uh, to resolve those. It does give you a message of the sort that you saw, which tells you what the IDs are, the thing you've got to resolve. But we didn't want to build up the explanations for how to resolve it in the upgrade code. I think it's better for us to do that in the support forum or the tech committees talked about a knowledge base. That would be a good place to do that as well. So it's kind of striking a balance where um, it's going to trust you if you're running the upgrade to uh, either find the resources to help you to understand those messages by searching for them, for example, or develop some expertise yourself. Um, and uh, Mark is asking yeah, about right. the, any like configuration variables. Um, do the pre-flight checks look into maybe configuration variables that change that need to be updated in the config file? No, right now, if there's a missing um, item in the configuration file, uh, there's uh, a, a failure. It's not the pre-flight check. Um, I think there might be one element that folks are going to run into if they don't review the documentation, which is around the, the change of locales. Um, we might have to adjust the error message for the failure just to be a bit clearer with what's going on there. Um, but that'll be a thing that comes out of the RC1 and RC2 testing. If it's a common uh, problem, we'll identify it. Okay, sounds good. I'm going to move on to the next uh, thing, which is... Um, Oh, just to mention that uh, one thing that we gain by having all the foreign keys declared is not just the referential integrity where it's much harder for people to introduce inconsistent data, but um, the ability for the schema to document itself. And this is a screenshot from just a quick test of the schema spy tool, which is an open source tool that allows for the database to describe itself. Um, one common question we get in the forum with anybody who's trying to develop OGS in any sort of depth is about the data model and where it's documented. And the answer is we have a, a thousand year old manual that attempted to list all the tables and describe the columns. Um, that was never well maintained. And it's also a really terrible way to maintain that documentation because every time you make a change to the schema, you've got to remember to also update the documentation. And it's just not uh, an automatic thing to do the way that it is with, um, with a schema spy type tool. So the database allows for tables and columns to self-describe. So where you create a table, a database column uh, or a table, you can add a description or a comment field. Um, between that and the types being implicitly declared when you create a table and the relationships being declared when you create a table with these foreign keys being added, um, a tool like Speak Schema Spy can automatically extract and uh, present really in-depth documentation about a data model. And so we'll be going through and adding uh, comments about different tables and different columns and all those sorts of things. Um, but already this um, is a way that you can now click around the relationships between tables to explore the data model in a way we've never had before. So that'll go alongside the um, API documentation and the um, Doxygen self-documentation as kind of the package of um, self-generated documentation that goes with each release of the software. Okay, next up is tasks and jobs. And I'm sorry, I'm not giving specific credit for all the folks who did these, these pieces of work, but uh, the dev team and uh, a lot of our closer partners have been really, really um, key to making these uh, these work right. So thanks to everyone. And uh, I'll make sure that we do <laughs> provide fulsome credit where we can. Um, so on tasks and jobs, uh, this is a, a new thing that we've added that allows for better offline processing of some of the things that typically take uh, a long period of time. So I'm just going to go in, um, I think I can still use this account. I'll go in now as, um, oh, I've been running updates. Let me just restore this from backup.
Okay, good. So I'm just going to reset this to uh, current state. And I'm going to go into an account. And just to remind you one of the motivating factors here. So one of the things that's been really frustrating for folks is that if you go into a submission um, and you, let's say, upload a new submission file, there in previous releases of OGS um, was a, a problem where this is the moment at which the text indexing was done on a submission file. And so this stage would just sit there and spin in around in a circle while the potentially very large um, uh, indexing database was updated. So you just saw that that doesn't happen anymore. And uh, that was part of a couple of specific changes here around uh, job processing. So I'm just going to go into the configuration file. I think I've got a slide here describing. Yeah, so previously the way that jobs were handled, this is around things like reminder emails, around, um, I don't even know what else we had, uh, the PLN deposits, for example. Um, previously, we had two tools that were used for that. One is cron, which is a server-side um, configurable uh, task runner. So once in a while, maybe once a day, maybe once an hour, um, uh, a script would be launched from the server side to tell OGS, okay, you can do your, your scheduled tasks. Um, and then the other way that people did this was if they didn't have cron configured or they weren't sure how to do it, they'd use a plugin called Acron, which would then piggyback on a request to OGS. And once in a while, it would then say, okay, now you've finished giving this person their response, now do some scheduled tasks. There's now three options. There's the, the cron for, um, uh, for continuity with most existing users. And there's a job runner, which is the equivalent of the Acron plugin, but no longer coded as a plugin. Um, there's a new option here, which I think we're going to see more as a modern deployment of PHP, which is called a worker thread. This is a, a Laravel uh, concept, but um, essentially it's a, a backend process that runs and just waits for something to show up in a job queue and, and processes it immediately. And one of the things that you'll see as we start to rely more on this is when you've got this worker thread installed, if there's an activity that uh, you're kicking off that might take a few minutes to process, uh, let's say a deposit to Crossref or something, um, you'll see with that running a much more immediate but not totally immediate feedback on it being successful or failing. You can imagine that you'll start a process that might take a couple of minutes, you might click around a couple of things and then you'll see, oh, by the way, this thing's finished. And so it'll be a lot more seamless that way. Whereas a cron uh, runner might um, cause that to happen once an hour, you might be gone by the time that feedback's available. And a job runner is just kind of, a, it's not a super reliable way to do this stuff for long running tasks because uh, server limitations might um, kill something in process. So um, we already saw that the uh, the process here was a lot quicker. I'm just going to turn off the job runner, which uh, took care of doing that automatically um, at the end of the, the request. I'm gonna upload another file. Let's do uh, a large one. It's a 12 meg file. Because I'm running locally, it doesn't take long to upload, but anyway. Um, so now what I should see is there's two views at this. Um, the first of these is a command line view. There's a command line tool called um, uh, toolsjobs.php, and it provides a bunch of different tools for interacting with the jobs queue. So what happened is um, when I uploaded that file, it flagged that the metadata has changed and something needs to be done. So this could be kicking off the internal indexing. This could be kicking off a, a Lucene indexing, all that kind of stuff. So I'm just going to list jobs. And you see there is this one job change that's been listed. And I can also run the job. So I'll just uh, do that. And that was super quick. But anyway, if you'd imagine if this was a longer job task, it could take a lot longer. Um, so um, I want to also show you quickly what the internal view of that looks like. And if you are logged in as an administrator, um, there is now a couple of tools here in the administration area. One is to uh, view the jobs list because I already ran it, it's gonna be empty. Uh, but something that might be important for, um, for hosting um, is there's a, now a way to view failed jobs. So this comes with a bunch of tools for kind of rerunning failed jobs if there was a temporary network hiccup or that kind of thing. But if a job fails uh, a number of times, um, then it'll be listed here in the failed jobs queue. And if you, um, if you, uh, need to debug why something's not working, you can come here to find that information. Um, let's do that demo. I want to talk just for a minute about modernization. 
Um, a lot of changes have gone to 3.4 to modernize the code base um, that are not going to be super apparent to users, but they represent just a ton of work. And you'll need to be conversant with this if you are maintaining modifications or, or a plugin. Uh, one is that we've added namespacing more or less everywhere. So uh, I know we've had a, a lot of trouble where, for example, a new version of PHP will introduce a class called string or XML parser because we have our own class called string or XML parser. Um, the, uh, there's a conflict and we have to rename ours and then uh, package up a new release of the software. That's an example of the kind of thing we work around by having namespaces. It means that um, the classes live in their own little kind of subdirectory and um, they don't all get piled in this one root namespace where there's a thousand different classes. If you're using um, uh, a, uh, an IDE that's got uh, autocomplete or whatever else, or you're looking at the documentation that's generated through Doxygen, you'll just see a, a kind of a folder-like organization of classes. Um, so now we specify which classes we use, we put our classes into a namespace, and all this kind of custom import stuff goes away. So any place where we were previously having to import classes, that goes away. There's a benefit to performance as a result of doing this, and there's also just moving towards a standardized means of coding that other folks who work with PHP are going to be able to uh, just pick up and start using, as opposed to having to learn all the quirky stuff that we've maintained over the years. Um, there's, I, I've already made reference to this just briefly, but there's a major renaming of locales. Uh, most locales no longer include country codes. So it's been a long thorn in my side that um, ENUS is US English, which is our English translation for a Canadian project. So English is now just EN. Uh, KUIQ, which is Kurdish, uh, we were forced to choose a country name and we chose Iraq, but Kurdish is kind of a stateless language and that was not really a, a great thing to force folks who use a Kurdish translation to have to identify as being Iraqi. Now it's just KU. And then we also were having trouble with WebLate, where, which is our translation tool set, where uh, folks, because they saw ESES -ES as Spanish from Spain, they thought that they were needing to create their own variants for other countries like Mexico. So we've merged those together into just as a common ES translation. In some cases, it's necessary to still maintain countries and country-specific translations. So for the moment, we've kept uh, FRCA, Canadian French, and FRFR, France French, as two separate translations. We may decide at some point that it's sensible to merge those two, but we kind of have conflicting guidance on that from our translators. But in the case of Portuguese, we certainly know we need to maintain a separate PTBR and PTPT translation. Uh, you will need to make sure that um, your uh, plugins are adapted for this with the 3.4 release. Um, and we do have a script that we may make available for folks to use here. It's really not a major complicated change unless you have a lot of translations or you do have conflicting translations you have to merge. So um, we'll have some documentation in the release notebook for that. I want to talk for a moment about release plans. Um, 3.4.0, we're now at the RC1 stage that came out uh, yesterday. That'll be used for internal testing. RC2 is gonna be used for um, for community testing and that'll be between basically March 7th and the, re and the release date for 3.4.0. Uh, wait for some social media announcements on that. And 3.4.0 final is gonna be on March 30th. Um, so I just want to add one last thing, which I don't think really got a presentation, which I know is gonna be of interest to a lot of folks. So let me just log in as D Barnes again. Uh, this is one of these things that has been on our list for a very long time and just has never quite uh, gotten into a release for some sort of technical reasons. It's a bit of a quirky thing to figure out, but we now have the ability to uh, add markup in titles. So this is a really common thing for um, uh, taxonomical names like bi uh, uh, biology journals. Um, also, if you're citing something uh, like a, a review article, you might want to use an underline uh, or italicize a title. That's now possible in title and subtitle fields. I think that's everything we have to cover. So I think we're on to questions. Um, could any of the other co-hosts maybe bring forward anything that's come up while I was presenting? Um, the, the one that I think could really be answered was, uh, for example, if people want to because uh, now that the ACOM plugin isn't necessarily the only way to do it, if people wanted to completely sandbox and install, make sure none of these scheduled tasks and things were run, um, uh, what would they need to do to do that? Yeah, we have some internal documentation on that that I've got to make sure is available somewhere. I think what we'll do is we'll link it uh, at first off of the community testing page. So whenever you're invited to be a community tester for any of these features, there's a, an invitation page where you can sign up and we'll put uh, a link to documentation into that form, but also into the email you receive to start uh, testing. Because a lot of the um, community testing is going to involve uh, you folks taking your own installs with your own 
history of data and so on and running it through, for example, the upgrade process. So we'll have some documentation there that includes how to disable the job runner so you don't accidentally you know, uh, deposit something somewhere. Also how to remove any API keys and how to anonymize email addresses and so on so you don't end up contacting your, your authors by accident. So watch for that to come out. It's um, a bit release specific. We do have some documentation on that for older releases, but as part of the community testing process, we'll include that as well. Uh, and Mark was asking about uh, translations with specific dialects and stuff. Um, are those are those still around, and, and, and what's that happening with them? Yeah, so we, we we support all the options we used to support, uh, but we also have an option for a locale code that does not include a country. So English is now EN. It's no longer necessary to, to declare it's uh, American. Um, uh, France, uh, sorry, French is, is uh, sorry, I'll use Portuguese as a better example. Portuguese, it's necessary to separate between European Portuguese and Brazilian Portuguese. So those are still PTBR and PTPT. And then some of the translations, we also have a uh, transliteration. So um, uh, Ukraine, we have both uh, Latin and uh, Cyrillic transliterations. And those continue to be, uh, in that case, Ukrainian without the Ukrainian country specification, but the two um, transliterations are still available. So we, all we're doing is we're we're generalizing the language where where possible. But in cases where it's necessary to maintain specific uh, designations, those are still available as options. Pausing for questions. Now is when I give some credit. Okay, so uh, yeah, the dev team. Um, I'm not going to name everyone off, but I'll say that we all have been working really hard on this for a good couple of years. Um, and I want to thank everyone, especially the last couple of weeks, for pushing through towards this RC1. It's been a lot of huge changes. Some of those are apparent from all this work that you've seen. Some of them are not as apparent until you maybe try to upgrade the release or see what we've been pioneering. It's going to be evident more in 3.5. I also want to thank uh, some of our partners. Um, we've been working really closely with Cielo, for example. Um, Cielo has been very helpful in providing us with condensed uh, feedback on what their large editorial community has been running into and what they expect. Uh, they've also been supporting us financially. Um, Crossref is, I believe, already received some kudos for their work um, resourcing us on the, the DOI deposits uh, tool set. What am I missing? Anything else? We have a, a ton of supporters who are also um, helping us out on, on a more general sense, and uh, that keeps us able to work. So thank you to all of you folks. The tech committee has been instrumental in a few things, including documentation, and they'll be very active on the community testing process. Um, who else is out there? It's a community effort. I'll just leave it at that. So thank you, everyone who's been participating. And if you are here, then you have been participating. So thank you. thanks to all of you as well. That's, I believe, all the questions, so I will leave it there. Thanks, everyone, and do watch for that community testing announcement. We'd love to have your help, especially if there's an area that you've run into problems before. Um, this is a great chance for you to check and see whether it's still going to be a problem for you and to have us make sure it's as simple and fixed as possible before the final release of 3.4.0. Thank you all, and take care.